thank you all so much for coming here tonight. It's not easy being a parent. It's not. So we're here to just give you some tools, talk to you about how you can support um, your child's mental health. So I am David Mills. I'm one of the prevention supervisors for our NJ4S program at the Mental Health Association. And my name is Taisha Matthew, and I'm a prevention consultant working underneath with a great team with David. So as you heard Dennis said, he's going to be working with us to provide um, programming not only to parents, but we can actually provide programming to students throughout Morrison Sussex County. And that is because of a program called the New Jersey Statewide Student Support Services Program. So we provide community prevention education like we're doing right now, right? We also provide um, prevention programming for students um, in schools. And we also provide brief individual counseling in schools. And everything we do is 100% free. Um, the brochure outside has all of our information. So if you, Dennis is, uh, Dr. Mulrooney's already involved with NJ4S, so you can reach out to him and, you know, he can kind of connect you with the rest of our services. And you can also email us too. That's in that, um, in that brochure. All right, so what are we going to cover today? So mental health is so important, right? Not just for yourself, but for your child. So we're going to cover a bunch of different topics um, that you see up on the screen. So let's begin by talking about mental health versus mental illness. So when we talk about mental health, it's something we all have, right? It's like your physical health. It's something that's there, it's never going away, right? Now mental illness is not something that's always there, right? It's something like depression or anxiety that is persistent and might affect your child's quality of living um, or the, the, if them showing up to school and things like that. So it's really important to remember mental health, it's always there. It's something to develop and work on. And then mental illness is things like anxiety and depression that are persistent and affect you know, our day-to-day -day life. Oh, there she goes. Thank you, David. Um, and one more thing I do wanna emphasize a little bit on for mental illness, that it, can, that it is diagnosed. Okay, that's something to keep in mind. So anxiety and depression, those are some examples of illnesses that are diagnosed. So being mindful about language. So when we think of mental health, some of the topics or ideas that come in mind are stigma, being viewed negatively. Okay, and so just like you see the image here, watering the plant, making sure that you have those discussions with your child about being comfortable with you, talking about their feelings, things that bother them or things that they might be going through. It's all about what we're creating as that space within that bond with the child. It is important to understand that our language is powerful. What we're saying does make an impact. Our tone makes an impact. How we are looked at when we're discussing these conversations with our youth is an impact and it's powerful. And that's why appropriate language, building that communication with them, how you engage with them is important. Yes. So the do's and the don'ts. So example would be focus on the person, not the condition. So an example would be my child has bipolar disorder, not that my child is bipolar. See the difference? Right there, focus on strengths and abilities, not the issues or problems or not what they're not able to do. So an example would be, my child has an active imagination, but not that my child's head is in the clouds, okay? And another, language changes over time, being flexible. So those are things that we're slowly adapting to, understanding when it comes to mental illnesses. Like we mentioned a little bit about depression and anxiety, and there is another topic as well that is heavy, but is important to discuss, which is suicide. And so, instead of saying Joe committed suicide, Joe died by suicide, died by something, not that he committed it. And the don'ts would include 
blame the child for their situation or condition. So let's say, for example, if you exercised more, or let's say perhaps your child is not eating as much as they used to, or if only if you ate more, if only you did this, then you would not have this problem. So when you're placing the blame on something that is happening, you're losing the essence of, wait, what is happening with my child? Why are they switching their behavior or not doing their regular routine or being as engaging as they used to? Okay. And some statistics, not too much. 50% of youth begin to show symptoms of mental health illnesses at the age of 14. Anxiety, depression, and ADHD are the most commonly diagnosed with youth, okay? In the year 2021, 1.70 million suicide attempts, attempts, okay? And in the state of New Jersey, 53 suicides of youth from the ages of 24 and under. So these numbers are very staggering, very alarming, unfathomable, but they're here. And that's something for us all here that I'm really happy and I commend you all to come and listen to these numbers. They're hard, they're hard wrenching, but there's something for us to consider. Now, another thing that affected every single one of us in this room and those outside this room, the global pandemic, not nationwide, worldwide, okay? Connectivity was key and is still key. Being able to connect with one another over the phone, FaceTime, seeing each other even via Zoom, those small little things that perhaps at the time prior to COVID, we kind of took advantage of it or maybe took it uh, granted, for example. So one in three high school students report poor mental health. 42% persistent feelings of sadness and 10% attempted suicide during those times. So even though the pandemic was globally challenging for all of us adults here, oh my goodness, not going to work, this and that, the youth, they were suffering, not being able to have that connection, that socializing, that engagement. Because as us caretakers, we're going through what we're going through and they were going what they were going through. And um, I just want to emphasize here, connectedness was key, right? So a little thing to add to your toolbox to think about is you start to see your child really isolate themselves for long periods of time. That's a sign to have a conversation, right? Our relationships are what keep us tethered, right? And, and when you're connected to people, your protective factor factors increase, which we're going to talk about right now, right? So I know that this can seem overwhelming, right? The, the list of risk factors is long, and it's a lot of things that are out of our control, right? But I want you to really take a look at the protective factors. So that first one is having a trusted adult to speak to, and this is the number one protected factor, right? So this is something that you can't put a price tag on, right? So this comes down to connectedness. And this might be hard, but sometimes you might not always be that trusted adult for your child, right? It might be somebody else. So just encourage them to connect with somebody, right, that they can trust and that you can trust. Um, and then, yeah, some of these other ones. Social connectedness is so important, right? High self-esteem, that comes from your relationship and the relationship your child has. So... I want to go back to talking about the difference between mental health and mental illness, right? We see what's the difference between stress and anxiety. So I know some of us can relate to, to this young, young person right here, right? Um, so stress is something that we can't avoid in life, right? And I know for our children, when we see them stressed, we immediately want to fix it and make them unstressed, right? But we can't do that, right? No matter, how, no matter how much we try, we really, we can't. So it's about just being open with your child, letting them know that it's okay to talk about um, things that are stressing them out and just listening to them. When they come to you with something that is causing them stress, I want you to all know that you don't have to fix it, <laughs> right? You don't have to fix it. Just listen 
and let them know you're there for them. And that will do so much more than, than you really realize it does. It may feel like you're not doing enough, but I promise you it is. Um, and, but anxiety is persistent, right? We're t that goes to mental illness, and that can lead to things like panic attacks, right? So if you're noticing um, your child start to have like persistent stress that is ongoing, um, that's affecting their ability to show up to school, to maintain relationships, then that might be a sign, hey, maybe my child is suffering from anxiety, and maybe we need to reach out for some, from, um, for some extra help. <coughs> so these are some common symptoms. We have um, some physical symptoms and then just some symptoms that you can observe. And a lot of these things are normal parts of development, right, in our children. So just because you might notice one of these things in your child, it doesn't mean that they have um, anxiety. It might be stress. But again, the thing is persistent, right? Your job as a parent is to observe small changes over time. And if you're seeing these things start to add up and accumulate and they're, they're always irritable, it's been going on six months and you're not seeing a change in their behavior, um, that might start leading to panic attacks. So those are things to look out for. Um, and then even physical symptoms. I know there's probably times in the morning, right, that your child is, oh, I'm, I'm feeling sick. I have a stomach ache, right? We don't really know what's going on at school. Yeah, they might, they might actually ha maybe have like a stomach bug or something, but a lot of times anxiety and stress can cause those physical symptoms. So they might, they're not faking it, right? They might, something might be going on at school or in life that's kind of stressing them out. So it's important to, to think about that. I believe this one, and I'm handing it over to Penny. All righty. Thank you, David. So in those moments when your child or youth were to have these panic attacks or anxiety or stress or feeling overwhelmed, there are some exercises that they can do, or this is also for you as well as adults. Sometimes we might be overwhelmed or feel as though we're exhausted from so many things. So examples can include grounding techniques, breathing techniques, guided imagery visualization, progressive muscle relaxation. So what I have done with youth for the guided imagery, I would suggest to them, think of a lava lamp. What does a lava lamp look like to you? They would tell me the colors, they would tell me the shapes, and then I would ask them, choose the color that resonates with them. Same thing for myself, sometimes if I'm upset or disappointed or discouraged, red and blue works for me. Okay, when it comes to progressive muscle relaxation, tense and release methods. So I would suggest to them as well, shrug up your shoulders and count to five seconds. One, two, three, four, and then five, and then able to bring them right back down. They might need to do it a couple times, but it allows them the opportunity for them to do it for themselves and also to recenter themselves and then be able to focus on the activity or task that is asked of them. Also, when it comes to hand breathing, I would give the example of putting your five fingers up and then inhaling up to the top of that finger and then exhaling down, inhaling all the way until we get to the last finger. So these are just a few, and since I did see a few people get some goodies right outside the hall, we do have the rainbow breathing exercise that they can do as well. Okay. And then for the breathing techniques, four, six, eight breathing. So Inhaling for four seconds, exhaling for six seconds. Inhaling for eight seconds, exhale for four seconds. So going back into the cycle, going back into the cycle, just like that. This one? Okay. So the difference between depression and sadness. So, but Taisha, we just went into techniques and now we're going into depression and sadness. I'll explain why. So, Keep in mind that sadness is temporary. I'm not saying that the feeling is invalid. I'm saying it's temporary. It's not something that's long going, lasting two, three weeks, or maybe months. It's something that's short lived. So a child may come home from school and not feeling too happy about an exam that they just did. They're not even sure if they did well on it. They're upset, they're sad. Versus for depression lasting longer, they're crying on the exam, but they're avoiding conversation. They start changing their routine. They start isolating themselves, even from you. 
let alone their normal activities such as sports or games or clubs that they usually do that they enjoyed, you start noticing that they're rescinding. They're starting to not do that anymore. So that's something to look out for for the differences between the two. Okay, now depression in youth. Physical symptoms can include poor hygiene, fatigue, drastic weight changes. It can be up, it can be down, but it's drastic, okay? Complaints of body aches like David mentioned earlier, self-harm, okay? Common symptoms can include sleep changes, maybe not even sleeping at all, okay? Sadness, irritability, isolation. So irritability can be 50-50. Sometimes you might be thinking they're just annoyed, but if it's persistent, if it's something that's ongoing, you notice it happened, okay, it happened this week, but then you're noticing for the next few weeks, it's consistent. It's not changing. So now, sometimes our child's mental health can, can lead to a crisis, right? So it's important to look out for what they're saying, their behavior, and their mood, their mood. So you really have to look at all three, right? So maybe they're saying things about, you know what, I just really don't want to be here anymore. And then you're noticing um, their behavior has really changed drastically and it has lasted for a long time, right? Like they don't want to do something, maybe they really into a video game that they love to play with their friends and they haven't been doing that for a while anymore. And then their overall mood. If their overall mood is, is, is going, um, is leaning towards like anxious, irritable, agitated, um, that's a sign that maybe a crisis might be on the horizon. You want to get ahead of it, right? And one of those crises that we talked about earlier is um, suicide, right? So that's why impo it's important to have conversations with your children and make it an open conversation, right? We don't know if it's leading to a crisis, but it's an important conversation to have. Um, and these are just some examples of that thoughts of suicide or don't always sound like this in our youth, right? And here are some myths and facts about suicide that are really important. I just want to read through each one with you. Um, so talking about suicide will put ideas into people's head and increase the likelihood of a suicide attempt. This is one of the major myths around suicide, right? It's like if you talk about it, they, they weren't thinking about it, but now they are, right? That's a, that's a big myth. If your child is not thinking about suicide and maybe you think it, it, you're noticing some changes, you want to talk to them about it, just you talking to them about it is not going to make them start thinking about suicide, right? But if your child is already thinking about it, it's important to have the conversation, right? The second myth, if people don't talk about suicide, they won't do it, right? That's another big myth. It's so important to talk about it because you could get ahead of it, right? You could, you could have that conversation and get them help. The third myth, if people talk about suicide, they won't actually do it. It's just a cry for help. Um, it's important to know that it's, it is a cry for help, but it's not like when people talk about suicidal thoughts and ideations, it's not for attention. It's because these are feelings they're actually having and they need help. If someone appears happy after they've talked about suicide, they must be over it. So maybe you notice someone in your life um, is... Um, hinting at suicide or you're noticing their mood has changed a lot and you bring it up to them and they're like, oh, no, 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 I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, or, or they actually open up to you, right, and then you see their mood change. It might be worth it to follow up on that, right? And if someone engages in self-harm, it must mean they have thoughts of suicide too. So self-harm does not always mean that that person um, is having suicidal thoughts and ideations. Self-harm is a way to cope with stress and anxiety. So don't automatically think um, if your child or someone in your life is self-harming, that doesn't automatically mean they're having suicidal thoughts and ideations. But it's good to have the conversation at least, right? I notice you've been harming yourself. 
Are you also having um, thoughts of suicide or killing yourself too? All right, Taisha. So just a little bit to reiterate what David mentioned about having the conversations, having the opportunity to engage more with your youth stems into active listening. So active listening is a tool to communicate, to show that you're attentive, your full attention. So meaning not multitasking. So once you're picking, up, picking them up from school and quickly trying to make a conversation and go on the run, no, it's not going to work. It's not going to cut it. Trying to cook and then do the laundry or do something else at the same time because this day and age, time is money. As they say, time is short. We need to get things done, and then I'll quickly do a conversation. No, because your child or youth may feel as though you don't have time to listen or what I'm going to say is not important because if it was important, perhaps mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle would sit down and listen. That's something to keep in mind. Making sure to leave enough time in case they want to disclose something with you. So even though you may be doing something or maybe just looking at the clock for the laundry, I'm like, oh, okay, it could sit there for about next 15, 10 minutes. Let me hear what they're going to have to say to me. Okay? And do not interrupt. Let your child finish the statements. So I sense that conversations can be hard. Your ears might start to bleed if you hear something you weren't prepared to hear. However, allowing them to finish their complete thought allows you to know fully what they have to say. Because even sometimes when we're talking, if someone cuts you off in the middle of it, you might actually forget what you're going to say. Or the tone of the conversation changes too. And so with that being said, using examples of reflection. So reflecting like a mirror. If they say something to you as a feeling, and perhaps what they're saying, you guess the feeling and it's incorrect, don't feel like they're not going to keep talking to you. They'll actually correct you with the correct feeling that they're feeling. So it sounds like you feel sad about X, Y, and Z. Another example, I'm not sure I follow. Sometimes you might hear something and you're, you're thinking about something else, so you're like, I'm not sure. You feel embarrassed when and you let them tell you, okay? Let me make sure I understand. You feel angry because of whatever that scenario was at the time that they addressed with you. So nonverbal communication, my goodness, there's so many things going on. So like I mentioned earlier about active listening, active listening includes with the being all multi-purpose, doing multiple things at once. Sitting down, see how we're all sitting right now and we're the ones standing? So imagine if we were sitting right in front of you. That full undivided attention, the tone of what you're saying. Your body, how does it feel? Are you actually crossing your arms when they're talking? When you cross your arms, you're basically saying it, you're shutting off. But when you have your arms open, you're willing to welcome what's going to be said, OK? All right. So going back to um, navigating the conversation about suicide with our youth, right? This is not an easy conversation to have. If you're suspecting that maybe this is a conversation that you should have, trust your gut and have the conversation. Um, it's not easy though, right? So be direct. Something you could say, for example, that's up here is, sometimes when people are having a tough time in life, they think about killing themselves. Have you ever had these thoughts? And then if the answer is yes, like I said, you can't fix that, right? So your job is to get them help. And we had our resources outside for those resources, right? There's crisis lines, um, obviously the emergency room if it's, if it's an active crisis. Um, so your responsibility as a parent is to listen and get them support. Like I said, you can't fix it. I know that's hard to hear. Um, but it, you can't. It's just you got to get them help, support them, and listen. Um, yeah. And also, don't promise that um, what they tell you will keep a secret, because if it's something about self harm or suicide, you can't keep that a secret, right? You have to um, reach out for help, take them to um, medical professionals. 
So this is f a good one for our uh, parents of younger children, right? Because it's all about getting started early when talking about your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So helping your children to label their emotions can be a part of every day. So if you see your child get frustrated or angry, say it to them. I saw when I took away your toy, you got really angry at me. Is that what you were feeling? And it might just be a simple, yeah, I got really angry when you took away my toy. Oh, wow, thank you for telling me. I didn't know. You know, I was trying to figure out what you were feeling. And that helps them later on to self-regulate emotions, right? If they can put, a, f put a, um, a word to what the emotion is they're feeling, that is a really big protective factor. Another one's for happy moments too, right? If your child is just really happy about something, wow, I see how happy you are. This is so exciting. What are you feeling right now? And just let them tell you. So the earlier you start this, it's really, really, really good. And it's not too late, right? This is something you can always do. And this is a good little tool for you, um, like a feelings chart. So maybe for your younger kids, um, if they don't want to talk or say something, can you point to what you're feeling right now? And that will get you a better idea. Like, oh, okay, so I didn't know that you were that you were feeling frustrated, right? What can I, is there something I can do to help you? So this is a really good one. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Thais. All righty, and what not to say. So by next week, you'll forget all about it. No, 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 no. Yes. We have. And it's okay. <laughs> Yes, or you're too young to have problems. That's another big one. Or my favorite, my life was a lot harder than yours. Uh, you see? So we're not saying that if you have said it, you are wrong, horrible. No, no, no. It happened at the time now, since we're all here, we know that's something to try to start slowly and surely refraining and starting to say different things because remember, my life is harder than yours, yes. However, now, things are a lot more different than it was before. So, we'll get through this together. What to say? You're not alone in this. I am here for you, okay? I am so glad you came to me about this. Some of the kids may not want to come to you about certain things. But yet, when they finally do say something to you, I'm glad that you chose me. I'm glad that you felt that you can trust me with this information. Because keep in mind, they're feeling what they're feeling. They don't know if they should say something to you. And that's why we talk about the act of listening, engaging, letting them feel like the door is always wide open. There's nothing closed about it. Okay? So with that being said, the importance of self-care for yourself as well as the youth and kids, your children, the wellness of, w of wellness. So self-care is not always easy to say no. I'm going to repeat that one for us here. Self-care is not always easy. Learn to say no. Maybe perhaps the time you want to have that conversation with your child, they weren't ready. Perhaps they wanted to rehearse it a little bit. Take some notes and then say, okay, mom, dad, this is what I want to talk about. It might be an hour later and then they're ready to talk to you about it. Okay? Managing your stress helps. Increases the ability to present with loved ones. So, couple of these things, when social, occupational, spiritual, intellectual, when all those parts that makes us us are connected together and whole, we're able to engage better. We're able to interact. We're able to have that dialogue, engage and be active listeners. So it's the same thing with the youth, with our children. If this something here is harming you, it's going to harm them. I'll repeat that again. If something here is missing from you and impacts your wellness, your mental well-being, your spirituality or your intellect or something about you is off, it will mirror with them too. So that's the information we have for you tonight. Um, you actually, on one of the handouts, this is all the um, like text lines and crisis lines. 
if you do find yourself in crisis or your child in crisis or someone you care about in crisis, these are great resources for you. Um, the, there's also even more on that one pager outside. So if you didn't get a chance to grab it, make sure you get it. It's a really, really good um, tool to have. And this is our contact information. So this is also on the, um, the brochure out there for NJ4S. So you have more questions about the services we provide to students and families. Like I said, everything is free. Um, don't hesitate to get yes. Don't hesitate to give us a a call or um, send us an email.